Well, church, I'm pretty sure we know that Jesus is alive. We don't serve some theoretical, ethereal, detached away from us God. But we serve a God who came in flesh and blood and tabernacled with us. And now is our risen and reigning Savior at the right hand of God and is forever making intercession for us. Forever. And here's the good news, church. The good news is that the kingdom of God isn't some faraway thing that we have to wait and long, although we do wait and long and hope for it. The kingdom of God is here. And it's now, and it's supposed to be breaking out in us, even on nights like tonight, when God does the completely unexpected in our hearts. Can you bring up my PowerPoint? I'm going to go a little deep tonight. And if the Lord tarries, I'm going to continue to go deep for the next series of sermons. Uh, it's an interesting term, that one, if the Lord tarries. And the young people are looking at me like, who's Terry? Is he some slow young person we have to wait on, like if the Lord Cody's or if the Lord Rachel's? It's just our awkward, strange little way of saying if the Lord should wait, if he should withhold his coming for a little while. Eschatology isn't something we talk about a lot anymore. And I have a theory about why we don't talk about eschatology so much. And my theory is basically this. Sunday evenings used to be terrifying, didn't they? Come on, be real with me, church. They used to be terrifying. I remember as a young person coming home from church some Sunday nights, and I had less assurance of my salvation than I ever had the first day I was saved. I remember there were days I would, I would just, I'd, the pastor's words would be ringing in my head, what will you be doing when the Lord comes? And, and I remember days, and I was walking in the light. I'd come home, and my parents' car wouldn't be in the driveway, <laughs> and they wouldn't be in the house. And I'd have my rapture call. Did anybody have one of those? Do you know the contact person you call, just in case? My rapture call was, was my Nan Nippert, and I knew if anybody, if anybody was going to make the rapture, it was Nan Nippert. So if I called Nan and she picked up the phone, I was okay. And thank God, every time I had that feeling, I called Nan and she'd be, oh, hello, Jeremy, you know. And she was, she was really happy to, to take my call. But that shouldn't be, church. We shouldn't walk away from a Sunday night talking about the Lord's coming and the kingdom of God beat up about ourselves. We shouldn't walk away terrified that the Lord's coming is something bad, that we have to, you know, oh no, Jesus could come at any moment. It's supposed to be our joy and our hope. The second thing I noticed about rapture services is it always puzzled me why Jesus got to wear clothes, but we don't in his resurrected body. I mean, how awkward would it be if in the garden Mary had met him and he wasn't wearing any clothes? But, but, but he was clothed, right? She, said she thought he was the gardener, and, and yet we think we got we to leave our clothes behind. Pentecostal eschatology, you're in a Pentecostal church in case you, you didn't know tonight. It doesn't really matter what denominational label's on the door, but this is, this is what we call ourselves a Pentecostal church because we believe the Holy Spirit is moving among us. Pentecostal eschatology right now is very pessimistic. It's very, and I remember whenever we came, even to youth services, sometimes we come and they'd be talking about the signs of the times. And my youth pastor would take out the newspaper and they'd talk about all the terrible things that were happening in the world. You know, they were talking about these these microchips, even back then, they're like, they're going to have little things implanted in your hand and you've got to watch out for it and watch out for the Lord's coming. And they talk about how bad the world was going to get before Jesus came. And our eschatology was very pessimistic. We thought she was going to tank, 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 tank. And finally she crashed and Jesus would come back and rescue us just at the lowest point when nothing good was happening anymore. And there are good scriptural reasons for some of that. Paul said to Timothy, there, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. You can think now as you're reading this. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I'm just kidding. They're wonderful. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And it's not very hard it's not very hard, is it, to connect the dots, church. We look at a scripture like this, and we're sure, if we were ever unsure that we're in the last days, after reading this, we pretty well know we're in the last days. But here's the thing. So is Paul. I'm going to go there. If you have your scriptures, you can turn with me to that passage in 2 Timothy. Let's get the context. Let's figure out why Paul says this in the first place. We're in chapter 2 first, and verse 16. Paul says to Timothy, avoid godless chatter, 
because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. And get this, they say that the resurrection has already taken place. Why is Paul teaching this to Timothy? He's saying there are people sitting in your pews right now, and they're teaching your people that the resurrection has already taken place. Paul says, but we know we're living in the last days. And he says, mark this, there will be terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. We just read all of that. And finally, you come down to verse 5, and he says, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. This wasn't something that was written for a long way down the road when Timothy would encounter these people. Timothy had these people in his congregation, and they were stirring up the pot, and they were telling people, the Lord has already come. You might as well give up. And, and Paul says to Timothy, don't have anything to do with those, those last days people who are sitting in your pew, who are lovers of themselves, who are lovers of money, who are proud and abusive and self-seeking, because they're just trying to lead your church astray. Have nothing to do with people like that. So at least by the time of Timothy in around AD 70 when this is written, they knew they were living in the last days, but we can go even further. The disciples expected Christ's imminent return. I promised the teens and preteens that have a Lego slide in every sermon, so if you're wondering why that's there. Of course, the famous line Peter says to Jesus, well, what about him? He points over to the disciple Jesus' love, what about him? You said I have to follow you and then I'm going to die a horrible death, but what about him? And Jesus says, if I want him to remain until I come, what does it matter to you? You are to follow me. So at least from that time, and Jesus didn't deny it, Peter expected Jesus could come back at any moment. And if you read through your New Testament, you'll find that they were rife with this expectation that any time at all, it didn't matter, as soon as they saw Jesus rise, rise up to heaven and they were looking up, they were probably waiting for him to come on back down again and rescue them. They said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? But there is a fact. This is people nowadays, right? You know what's going on in that picture? Can you read it up there? Yeah, isn't, that, isn't that true? That's just where we're at, right? Jesus warned us, and he warned his disciples, he said, because they asked him for signs of his coming too, and he, he warned them, he said, this is what it's going to be like when you're ministering in these last days. He said, sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And what Jesus had in mind here was the fact that in just a few short years after the Holy Spirit came and the church was born, the church was about to encounter some intense persecution. And I'm not talking about taking crosses off of schools or not letting us talk about Jesus in public places. I'm talking about the kind of persecution where the emperor would impale a Christian, dip him in oil, light him on fire, and stick him as a lantern in his garden. That's the kind of persecution they were enduring. So Jesus says there will be terrible times. I've got to warn you guys. You're in the last days, and there are going to be terrible times. After I, after I die, after I rise again, you're going to encounter some stuff that's going to make people want to grow cold. And any Christian who's sitting on the fence, as Noah put so eloquently last week, the devil owns the fence. And he said, any Christian who's sitting on the fence, they're not going to stick with it when the emperor starts doing this to people and other things. We've all heard this, right? Smile and nod if you're with me. I know this is hard. The great falling away, have you heard of that? Because they taught me when I was going to church, no disrespect to my pastors, please don't hear that. I honor, I honor and respect those who went before me because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be a Christian. But they taught me this. That before Jesus came back, there would be this, and the church would tank, and the world would tank, and then finally Jesus would, what? What are you laughing at, Rhonda? Where do we get this idea? The term, the great falling away, you'll find in one translation of the Bible, and you'll find it in a passage in 2 Thessalonians. And if you're good scripture-carrying Christians, I know Jeff probably has this in his pocket. You can pull it out and come with me to 2 Thessalonians. And most of it is on the screen for you there. And here again, we find that Paul is correcting. And he's talking to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is verse 1, and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord had already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not, will not come until the rebellion, the great falling away, the apostasy, the, uh, in Greek, the apostasia, 
Until that occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So what is Paul saying here? He's got a group of Christians sitting in his church who think that the rapture already happened. And they think we're living in the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord is already here and God is already judging. So what's the point? We're already living in the day of the Lord. And Paul says, no, no, do you remember the conversations I had with you when I was there in Thessalonica? He said, I told you that that day won't happen if you miss the, I don't know how you miss, you know, Christians leaving, leaving the earth. But if you miss that, he said, these signs are going to happen during the day of the Lord. There's going to be a great falling away and, and it's in connection with the revealing of the Antichrist. So this great falling away wasn't something that was supposed to happen before the rapture of the church. This is something that's supposed to happen after and is a sign that the day of the Lord is already here. Are you following me? So the great falling away wasn't something that was supposed to happen in the last days of the church just before the rapture and we're supposed to tank and everything's supposed to go, you know, crazy, the bottom's out of her and all that stuff. But it was supposed to, it was supposed to be that uh, something that was supposed to happen after the rapture when, of course, the church is gone. We have great reasons for a great apostasy to happen because you have these halfway believers. All right. Good. Are you still with me? Smile and nod. Excellent. Thank you. See, you guys like Looney Tunes? I like Looney Tunes. There's good reasons why not to believe about the, in the great falling away in Scripture. There's great reasons in Scripture not to believe it. But there's an even better reason, you know, after that. And that's the fact that if you tell Christians before Jesus comes, what? You like that? He does, doesn't he? If you tell, squirrel, if you tell Christians that before Jesus comes, it's just going to get worse, 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 and worse, and worse, what's going to happen? What happened? What would happen if the animator took Wile E. Coyote aside and said, hey, can we sit down for a second? I, I hate to tell you this, but um, you're never going to catch him. You're going to put out the bird seed, and he's going to eat it, and then you're going to blow up for some reason. Or that anvil you have put up there, that's actually not going to fall on him. It's going to fall on you every single time. And you're going to do this through the countless ages of eternity until finally you're, you're exhausted. And people will laugh at you. People will be sitting at home laughing at you all the time. What would happen if somebody told those poor generals, you're never going to win the basketball game. I'm sorry, guys, but the Harlem Globetrotters are just going to beat you every time you do this. It's just for the show. It's just for the entertainment of people. This is what will happen if you tell a church it's going to tank and tank and tank and tank, and then finally Jesus is going to come and take you out of it. You have a church that's utterly despondent. Keep calm and let the world burn. <laughs> Environmentalism. Well, what's the point of that, sure? I mean... It's all, gonna, it's all just going to be tore up anyway and burned by fire, and we won't have any more use for the environment, sure, if we're, if we're Christians. What about evangelism? Well, what's the point of evangelism? You're, you're going to save people, but before Jesus comes, most of them are going to fall away anyway, so you might as well not even evangelize. And what about the quality of life of the people all around you? What about your, your community? What about your city? What about the people in Cornerbrook who are saying, if only I had some hope to hold on to, we say, well, we'd love to give some to you, but there's actually no hope. <laughs> Jesus is going to come for us, but you're probably not going not to be saved. Oh my, is right. So what does Jesus say about all this? What would Jesus think of the ones who are on TV waving around a newspaper and making people crazy because they think the end, is, the end is going to come? The disciples knew that Jesus was going to come anyway. Why wave around a newspaper? What would Jesus think? He said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, would you read this with me? Do not be alarmed. Well, there you go. Shut off the TV when that stuff comes on. Because Jesus told us it's going to happen. Don't be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation. It's been happening since the beginning of creation. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. It gets better. If there's any time in history when they should have expected Christ was coming because of wars and rumors of wars... Don't you think it's when an antichrist was systematically eliminating God's people? And when a mad dictator was trying to take over the world? Don't you think that would have been a good time to be alarmed? But Jesus says, don't be alarmed when you hear about wars and rumors of wars. These are just the beginning of birth pains. The end is still to come. Or what about during the 1970s and 80s? When we thought in any small town in little old America, a nuclear warhead could just drop out of the sky and flatten us all. Because people were terrified during that period. That's why we had that wonderful book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Would Come Back in 1988. 
His people were terrified of the Cold War. Let's hear Jesus' last word. And this is in that whole scripture. You can, I wish you had your Bibles with you. You could just scan down with me about wars and rumors of wars and the love of many growing cold and all these things that are just the beginning of birth pains. Don't be alarmed. And then he says this. He ends on a word of hope. He says, and this gospel, this good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So what is the sign of his coming? Not wars, not rumors of wars, not the love of people growing cold. The sign of his coming is that the kingdom of God is being extended in all the earth and the gospel is being preached to all nations. Jesus ends on hope. He ends on good news. He says, church, get up and get out there because I'm coming soon. Rescue as many as you can. There's this beautiful chapter 1 Corinthians 15, if you've never read a chapter in the Bible before, read 1 Corinthians 15. It's amazing. It's all about the resurrection of Christ. It's all about, as Christians, how we don't have some halfway little hope about us floating up in heaven with harps and, you know, doing church for eternity. Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. I get this question at Easter all the time. These kids come up to me, right? Because you know elementary kids. They'll ask anything. And they say, Pastor Jeremy, why did Jesus have to die? And I just give them the standard answer. Well, he died, so we go to heaven. They said, so... Nobody went to heaven before Jesus died? That's terrifying. I said, no, 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 no. That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean, okay? I mean to say that Jesus' spirit didn't go to heaven. His body rose up and he resurrected and he walked on the earth among people. And because Jesus' body rose, because there was an actual resurrection, not just some spiritual detachment of his spirit from his body, but a real resurrection, we have hope of a real resurrection too. It's not just about us floating around in glory land. We're coming back here to rule and reign with Christ. And if you don't believe me, open your Bibles to Revelation 21 and 22. There's going to be a thousand years and then forevermore on a new heaven and a new earth. And those streets of gold, we won't be up there on harps and clouds eating cream cheese, enjoying it. We're going to be down here walking around. Kids get terrified. Kids are like, but but Pastor Jamie, is it going to be like church forever? (laughs) Right, Kieran? I heard this question. Is it going to be like, is it going to be boring? Is heaven going to be boring for etern- eternally bored? It's like long weekends at Nans, right? I'm just kidding. No, it's going to be much like what you're doing now, only you can't get hurt. Only there's no sin. Your body will never get sick. You'll never experience pain. You'll never go to a funeral again. Because Jesus is here and he's reigning as king on earth. Where it matters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the, and the whole chapter is about how good the earth is and how he made it for us. We've got this idea as Christians that the whole point is to escape it and so Christ can rule over it. So the end of this chapter about the resurrection, I digress. I'm so sorry, church. I digress. The end of this chapter, he says, therefore, because Christ rose in a real body, because you're going to have real bodies too that are going to be resurrected and changed in the, twink- in the twinkling of an eye, be steadfast. Be immovable. Be always abounding in the work of the Lord because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He's saying everything we're doing now matters. Carrie, when you're at the hospital and you're praying with people, it matters. If we're making a difference in the quality of the lives of the students at Grenfell and we're giving them winter coats, in God's kingdom it matters. If you're raising your kids in the wisdom and instruction of the Lord, oh, it matters. Let's get back to a hopeful eschatology. Let's get back to what we're seeing tonight and celebrating tonight and let that kind of enthusiasm and expectation permeate every moment of our lives. This is what happened. This is what I think happened. Western Christianity got bored. Western Christians got so used to having no persecution and no trouble and the government just, you know, whatever the church wants to do, we're with that. And we got so complacent and so bored that Western Christianity did tank. Because in North America, you look right around right now, almost every denomination is in decline. And so we say, oh, well, this must be the great falling away. I guess, you know, North American church is pretty dead by. I came on Sunday night last week and I just as well go home. But you look in Africa, where 100 years ago, Christians were less than 10% of the population. And now they're at nearly 500 million Now they're at one out of every four Christians in the world is in Africa. Can you imagine that transformation? That's the kingdom of God breaking out. That's God moving in the world. You look at what 
God's doing in Daniel's neck of the woods. Go to Brazil. Ask what kind of Christianity is there. Because they come here and they're like, you guys are so dead. Daniel's like, oh, church here is just, whoa, man. I got to find a way to liven this up a little bit. Because Christianity is happening down there. (laughs) And sorry to burst some bubbles, but it's not just the Pentecostals. It's happening in all the denominations. God's moving by his spirit and people are being saved in droves. What does the Bible actually say about the last days? Paul says, live hopefully. Don't grieve like people who have no hope. When you have a funeral, let it be a celebration of a life lived for God and a life that's going to go on into eternity and that you're going to meet him someday and he's come, going to come back down here with you with the resurrected body and you're going to have tea. Because Jesus ate and drank with the resurrected body in case you didn't know. It says in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. This is the last days I'm looking forward to and we're seeing it happen right before our eyes. It says make the most out of every opportunity because, not if, because the days are evil. Because it's so dark that our little candle just shines so bright and the darker it gets, the more beautiful the church looks to those who are lost and seeking hope and in need of Jesus. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. He's patient with me for certain. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What does God want to do in the last days? Why is he waiting so long? Scripture says, oh, he's just holding it. He's just holding it because he's so patient and he's so long-suffering. And he just wants as many people as possible to come and reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. That's why he's been so long coming. Because the church is supposed to explode in the last days and the kingdom of God is supposed to break in. I'm not going to labor this point long because Brad Noel did a much better job and he's much smarter than I am. But he took us to a passage where God is speaking to the exiles in Babylon. It's very much like us. They're waiting for deliverance. They're waiting for God to bring them back home. And he says, while you're there, I don't want you to decrease. I want you to increase. I want you to sing the songs of the Lord in a distant land. I want you to seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile and pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. What are we supposed to do in our time down here? Are we supposed to get cloistered in our little monasteries and get really scared about all the things that are happening around us? Get really worried about the wars and get really worried about Russia right now? Are we supposed to get really worried about the societal trends and the wickedness? No, we're supposed to be excited about the potential for the kingdom of God to break out in our very town. And we're supposed to be a beacon of hope. This church should be a beacon of hope should be broadcasting to the entire neighborhood all around us that Jesus saves, that he saved us, and that we're excited about his coming. Oops, I broke it. It's okay. I don't need it anyway. Let's brow. I'm going to invite the band to come back. God, you've been just so amazing tonight. Your spirit is just so incredible, so powerful. And if this is the last days, Lord, let him come. When you're going to stir us up and move the church out. And don't just let it happen in Africa and in Asia and in South America. Oh, God, let it happen here in North America. And if you want to move in these last days, would you start right here? Would you start in me? Would you start by making me so uncomfortable with the way I do my Christianity? God, that every day, every day, every moment should be a life lived in your resurrection power. God, that we should wake up and say, God, what have you got for us today? Not just on Sunday, what do you got for the church, but what do you got for us today? I can't wait to go and do miracles. I can't wait to go and see lives changed by your glory. Amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Come and let your kingdom extend 
and then come and reign here as king.